In this episode of Power Within Focus, we learn about the new civics education law in the public schools, visit a downtown art gallery where student artists are displaying their work, and sit down with an Olympic gold medalist at a local sporting club. All this and much more on this episode of Power Within Focus. Hello and welcome to Falmouth in Focus, FCTV's current affairs program. I'm your host, Michael Kasparian. Springtime on the Cape has brought us two construction projects that will impede traffic flow for several weeks. The Bourne Bridge construction began on March 25th, restricting travel to one lane in both directions, 24 hours a day, until completion around May 23rd. Here in Falmouth, the first phase of the Route 28 water main replacement project began in early April and is scheduled for completion in early June. Steve Rafferty, the Falmouth Water Department Superintendent, wants residents to be aware that detours and partial road closures will affect motorists traveling from Oxbow Road to Sandwich Road during the project, generally Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Project information and traffic plans will be regularly updated on the Water Department's webpage and the Falmouth Police Department's Facebook page. Next fall, Phase 2 of the project will begin from Sandwich Road to the Admiralty Inn. Dozens gathered for a rally held at the Village Green in coordination with other rallies being held across the country to demand the release of the final report of the Mueller investigation to Congress and the public. The League of Women Voters and the Falmouth Public Schools recently sponsored a program at the Falmouth Public Library to discuss the new civics education law, which was designed to promote and enhance civic engagement in Massachusetts schools. FCTV was there to cover the event. So um, Judy Zist reached out to our office uh, with an inquiry initially about the new law for civics education um, and the governor's initiative around civics. So our team came together and talked about what the plan would be. And so we agreed to come this evening and do a short presentation with a panel discussion so that we can have a bit of a Q&A and help um, to understand where our community connections could be too. So one of the approaches that we've taken is to really catalog uh, civic opportunities that are already happening. And so we've looked at those across all subject areas and then taken the civics standards themselves in the new framework and looked at where they are already starting to happen and ways that we can elevate that experience. And then the new project uh, that's incorporated. So we're really trying to build out the project, taking lessons we've learned from the high school senior project and bringing some of those lessons to the eighth grade for the new eighth grade civics project. Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is with the civics project that is coming, um, we need involvement with the community. That's not going to work unless people are out there and supporting it. Um, Mike and I were actually talking today and one of the real benefits that Lawrence has, and it's going to be eighth grade at Lawrence, is it's right over there and downtown is right over here. And we can walk. I mean, there's no bus piece to it, anything. And if we, we could get a group of kids who want to work with someone at town hall or someone, it can be done very easily here. And that's just such an advantageous situation for, uh, for Falmouth as a town. So we're starting to make um, some adjustments now in terms of identifying and curating some resources. And then uh, from there, we're going to start to implement some unit changes next year for students and we hope to have a short version of the project for eighth grade next year with the full implementation in the uh, 2021 school year. For more information about the Falmouth School's civics curriculum, check out their website at falmouth.k12.ma.us. Thanks to Bob Fenstermaker for that story. It's time now for three things from Town Hall. FCTV's condensed version of the takeaways from recent municipal meetings. Selections are chosen based on community impact. Allison Leshen of the Route 28 Citizens Advisory Committee presented the final report of the committee after months of discussion and meetings finding the best solution for motorists, pedestrians, and cyclists to share this heavily trafficked corridor. 
The presentation gave detailed plans for that section of the highway between Sandwich Road and Oxbow Road, including sidewalks on the north and south of the road wide enough for pedestrians and cyclists. Basically, the roadway will consist of 11-foot travel lanes with a, then a fog line, the white stripe that you see, and then two more feet of pavement, pavement that's part of the roadway. Then there's a granite curb that will go up, and there'll be a two-foot, approximately two-foot vegetated buffer. And then on the uh, south side of the path, which is kind of the water side, uh, there'll be an eight-foot multi-use path. I've often said for every project, every major <coughs> initiative, we absolutely have to include transportation because our roads were not made for the capacity we're already handling. If we're going to keep growing, that element has got to be addressed. The Falmouth Preservation Alliance spoke with the Selectman Monday night concerned for the Edward Marks Building or the Poor House. The Alliance questioned the plan of moving the Falmouth Human Services Department into the building, suggesting that the improvements to be made are not adequate for such a valuable historical landmark in Falmouth. Perhaps the uh, Human Services Department could move to the existing, the current um, senior center because we, we viewed that as a, something that could be done much more easily than moving into an historical building with the complexity of uh, the poor house. And the town manager mentioned at the last meeting we addressed this that there would be, you know, some kind of duality of improvement, that there would be, while the human services folks were working, there would be appropriate renovation of the building, restoration is, is the correct term. James Vieira, Council on Aging Chairman, addressed the board regarding staffing for the Senior Center in anticipation of the completion of the new building. Mr. Vieira mentioned the new staff member to be voted by town meeting this spring, and he hopes to add more positions in the future to assist with the Senior Center's growing demand for services. And certainly additional staffing has always been part of the discussion, you know, right from the start when we started talking about a new building. We knew that it would, it would lead ultimately to more staffing. You know, I want a job description, but I also want to know how many times during the day that's going to be required before I'd be willing to stand up and support adding a staff to the particular facility. So that's what I'm basically saying. I need specifics and how many times, and that's the kind of information. But at this point, it's nice to say, you know, we need to be looking forward to potential need for this kind of staffing support. To see the meetings in their entirety, Check out Government Channel 15's program schedule at fctv.org. We turn now to this month's calendar segment. The 12th biennial Woods Hole Model Boat Show begins Saturday, April 13th at the Woods Hole Historical Museum. This celebration of small ships is an opportunity to view exquisite workmanship and meet model boat craftsmen from all over New England and beyond. The annual Easter Egg Scramble will take place on Saturday, April 20th on the lawn of the Falmouth Public Library where the Easter Bunnies from the Falmouth Village Association will scatter 8,000 treat-filled Easter eggs for your little ones to collect. The Woods Hole Trad Stroll is scheduled for Saturday, April 27th and features an afternoon and evening of traditional music at multiple Woods Hole venues. And from April 28th to May 12th, enjoy the beautiful May baskets along Main Street and Queens Byway, and visit the Falmouth Village Association on Facebook to cast your vote for the winner of the People's Choice Basket. Here at the Mazer Gallery, photography by members of the professional photographers of Cape Cod will be on display throughout April. And finally, here at FCTV, we will be hosting our April Vacation Animation Camp for students aged 8 to 12. Please call FCTV to sign up. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll stop by the Gallery on Main for a special art show opening reception. Stay with us. Hello, I'm Lee Geisiger of Vagabond View Photography and Chairperson of Arts Falmouth. Arts Falmouth is an umbrella organization created to celebrate, sponsor, and promote visual, performing, and literary arts and artists in and around Falmouth. We aim to foster a creative economy that will strengthen both the arts and the business community. 
In 2019, Arts Falmouth celebrates its 15th year as an integral part of the Falmouth community, and we're proud to once again showcase the arts through our flagship events across what we call the Art for All Seasons. On April 27th, the Trad Stroll kicks off the art season in Woods Hole with Celtic, old time, folk, roots, renaissance, and medieval music and dance from lively fiddle tunes to intricate harmonies on ancient instruments as artists paint and artisans show their wares. Come celebrate spring and visit the restaurants, the Woods Hole Historical Museum, the Woods Hole Community Hall, the Woods Hole Library, and they're all hosting performances. There's something for everyone's taste. Arts Falmouth is proud to continue our collaboration with the Falmouth Village Association and producing our other two events of 2019. The first is Arts Falmouth's Arts Alive on June 21st through the 23rd. Arts Alive, a perennial favorite at the start of summer, is a free three-day celebration of the arts in Falmouth and the Upper Cape. Arts Alive takes place in the heart of Main Street in Falmouth at the Library Lawn and Shore Street Extension. The festival features over 60 performances of theater, spoken word, dance, and music for all tastes, jazz, classical, folk and fiddle, pop, rock, and we're including the kids in every aspect. There's a town dance on Friday night, a rock fest Saturday night, and over 50 artisans and craftspeople displaying and selling their wares. The third event, right in the prime time of autumn, is the Jazz Stroll in October. Again, Arts Falmouth is partnering with the Falmouth Village Association to feature the Jazz Stroll as part of Falmouth Village's month-long Jazztober celebration on Saturday, October 19th. This free Jazz Stroll is in the park and shops along Main Street, Falmouth Museums on the Green, Queens Byway, Fall for Jazz. We would like to thank our sponsors from 2018, Wood Lumber, Falmouth Road Race, the Falmouth Village Association, Cape Cod Five, Martha's Vineyard Savings Bank, Music Drives Us and Art Week, the Woods Hole Foundation, the Mass Cultural Council, and Cape Cod Foundation. And we welcome Rand Atlantic Cape Cod Realty in North Falmouth as a 2019 sponsor. Check Arts Falmouth out at artsfalmouth.org or on Facebook at Arts Falmouth. We thank you for your continued support as we continue to support the arts. Welcome back. The Gallery on Main in downtown Falmouth is hosting an art show entitled Zoom In, Zoom Out, Young Naturalists on Cape Cod, featuring artwork and illustrated poems by Falmouth High School students. FCTV stopped in for the opening reception. So the display we have today uh, represents about 70 artists. We have their uh, visual interpretations and we also have some awesome, some really beautiful poetry. I invite you to take a close look at their work because you'll leave very inspired. Just about every year, luckily for us, the Falmouth Education Foundation has funded a grant project in which we are, uh, Lauren Kenny, uh, the AP English teacher and I, are able to take our students out into, into the landscape, put their phones away, get their sketchbooks out, and really take notes on where they are and the world around them. We've been going to Brewster, and we've been going to Monomoy, we've been going to Provincetown and Eastham, and these places that they're not necessarily used to, and they're really able to kind of get a fresh look at Cape Cod and if you if you read their notes from the field trips they really were paying attention to the time and the day and the weather and those notes influence their writing and influence their artwork and then when they get back to the studio they're able to really um, feed off their notes and their sketches and and their th all the recordings that they have and they're able to make these artworks which I think are really special because they're they're invested in them and um, I think it shows I think there is this hill, and I think it was at Monomoy, and I really liked it because the beach was really long, and there were a lot of these hills, and they're all really uniform with each other, and I thought it was really cool how like nature kind of repeats itself. There was this line between the sky and the clouds, and it was really distinct, and like I hadn't really seen something like that before, and I had like kind of trouble putting that into my art, but I really wanted to. For my zoom out, I did a giant like dead tree and that was more of like a far away picture like of like more of the perspective of the land and then for the zoom in it was like more of an up close picture of like an object. For this piece, my bird, uh, which was a sharp hawk, we were at a sanctuary with a bunch of stuffed animals 
and uh, for this piece, I got that's where I got my idea. But then for the background, I took it out of like my head. My painting is uh, of sort of the edge of water meeting um, the land, and I'm inspired by the Red Maple Swamp, which is where we went on our school uh, excursion. Um, it was a really beautiful day out, and uh, the reflection of the sky in the water really took me, and I, I wanted to try and capture that. And I took reference photos and then came back to school and painted it. I actually did not end up being able to go on the trips. I didn't want to miss math. And, however, I was scrolling through the computer, looking through the beautiful pictures that they took on the field trips, and I found this frog. And I thought, wow, this is such an interesting picture. It's so zoomed in, and you can see so many details of the slime and the texture of the frog. And I just, I was intrigued and I wanted to create life in a picture and it was my first colored pencil piece ever and it's probably my favorite. I love doing the the uh, journals I just did mine in, in pen and watercolor because it's uh, very fun just to you know, you know slap some some drawings so then you know be able to put some just easy color on top of it so um, there's a huge difference between looking at pictures of things and you know writings uh, to actually being there and experiencing it it's a, it's a completely different feel I'm just really lucky to live in a place like this and we can be you know such inspired artists from the things that are right outside of our doors the students work will be on display through most of April so stop in and take a look Thanks to Andrew Richards for that story. An Olympic gold medalist in curling visited Falmouth recently to speak to students about his sport and FCTV caught up with him at the Cape Cod Curling Club. All the kids are a lot of fun. Uh, that that kind of, in the longer days on tour, the, the kids are what give you the energy again. You know, their enthusiasm for the sport and the way they tear around the ice out there. And just being on the ice is great for them. You got kids driving an hour just to be here every week so they can go out and, and have fun and you know for those of us that stepped away from the game and you know we're doing things off the ice to help it those are the things that you know get you fired up about the sport again too is seeing that enthusiasm from the little ones especially and knowing that you know the future of our sports in good hands because there's that kind of enthusiasm from the kids uh, yeah there's there's a certain amount of excitement that you get from the kids just because of that Olympic gold medals thing uh, they're really enthusiastic too, though, and very attentive listeners. It's always hit or miss with the the big groups of kids because you just don't know, you know, depending on what part of the day it is, if they're going to be tuned in or not. But uh, every stop we had, the kids were great. They had a lot of good questions. Uh, we got them doing some gym curling too, and uh, in every stop, I, I think pretty much everyone. We pitted the teachers against each other in gym curling, and that's what really gets the kids going. So they get to cheer for and against their favorite teachers. And, uh, and just to, to see, again, that, that type of uh, energy towards anything that has to do with our sport, even if it's gym curling, is great. The main message that we try to get across in all the traveling that I do now is, especially speaking to the parents of these children, that. There's a lot of kids when they go through their middle school and high school years that they don't really feel like they have a place in life or, or some place that's theirs or a group of people that's theirs. And the curling community is the most welcoming group of people you can possibly imagine. So you know, maybe your kid isn't the strongest, the fastest, jumps the highest. There's still a place for them in the curling club. And the reason why I love to play my entire life more than anything else is the people. And that never changes from the, the time you start to the elite levels of the game. So if parents understand that a curling club is a place that their kid can go regardless of who they are, where they come from, how athletic they are, it's not that it's not an athletic sport, but you can play it at any level and still enjoy it. And you're always gonna feel like you have your own place to go and your group of people with curling. And, and if there's kids out there that find that and that you know, does something for their lives, changes their confidence level or anything, then that's, that's the best thing that we can do for them and for our sport. As long as clubs want me to show up, I'm gonna keep traveling and keep doing it. Uh, I don't know that competitively I'm gonna get back into it anytime soon or not. If I was gonna play again, I'd probably, like for the next Olympics, I'd probably have to make that decision sometime in the next six months. But 
I'm really happy with what I'm doing. It's you know, There's a few times in your life where you feel like you are where you're supposed to be and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and that's where I'm at right now. And to, to feel like you're actually doing something for not just a sport but a community of people that you're very passionate about and and you're giving something back to it beyond the competition on the ice and I couldn't really ask for anything more than that so as long as as I can continue to do this I will uh, as long as I feel like I'm still making a difference and, and doing good things for the sport then, then that's what I plan to do. If you're interested in seeing more world-class curlers in Falmouth check out the summer spiel in July at the Cape Cod Curling Club. Thanks to Alan Russell for that story. Students at the Morse Pond School recently participated in a charity fundraiser to benefit people without access to clean drinking water. Let's take a walk for water. The Walk to Water is a fundraiser that our sixth graders do here at Morse Pond. It raises money for Concordia School now, um, which is a school in Mombasa, Kenya, which I visited last summer. We started this fundraiser because it's an offshoot of the novel that the kids read, A Long Walk for Water, which includes a story of a lost boy from Kenya and a Sudanese girl who are walking for water, who has to walk every day for water <laughs> for her family. So this emulates it, the walk, and it, it teaches our students about global citizenships. And we've been very lucky to raise lots of money. We've built boreholes for the school. We've put in bathrooms in with, so that they can have clean water and we've made an impact on what those students get every day for education. Well, we were raising, we were raising money for, throughout the whole week for them, and then we're doing this to simulate what people have to go through there in their long walk to water every day, forward and back. It was really fun because there's a tons of kids doing it, and all for the people in Africa. Watching the kids do the walk for water this morning and participating with them was just such a wonderful experience. It really helps the kids have an understanding of what it means to have empathy for the folks that were in Africa that didn't have the water. And what we've been able to do to bring water to those communities through this effort is, is phenomenal. I think the thing that kids really don't realize is, is the struggle that a lot of people face around the world. And this is one little bit of insight that they can glean through their reading and then actually through this experience. It was, it was wonderful to be able to participate. The event raised more than $4,700 to benefit the Concordia School in Kenya. Thanks to Ryan Weber for that story. After this short break, we'll be back with more from the Falmouth Public Schools. Stay with us. Did you know that YMCA Cape Cod and Falmouth Aquatics are working together? We share our vision of a new YMCA facility here in Falmouth. Working together, we'll have a greater mission impact and change lives for the better. We envision key programs and services, such as teaching kids to be safe in and around the water, helping people lead healthier lives, and creating high-quality programs that serve, engage, and motivate our community. Did you know we are now operating several Y programs without walls in Falmouth with great success? We've been collaborating with the Falmouth community for over five years. We offer before and after school programs, early childhood learning and preschool programs, summer camps and vacation programs, and food programs for hungry children. No one is turned away from the YMCA due to an inability to pay. How do we create the facility that will be the platform for these and future programs? We are working together on our combined facility design for a 13 to 15 million dollar project and finding a location here in Falmouth. Do you know there's a lot more planning before a shovel goes in the ground? The Falmouth Wants a Why Volunteer Committee works tirelessly to raise every dollar needed for studies. Volunteers are actively raising money for our capital campaign consultants, where we need $75,000. We're also recruiting volunteer leadership for our capital campaign. We want to work with energized people to pull this YMCA into the community. If you want to learn more about Falmouth Wants a Y for the Upper Cape, visit our website or give me a call. Welcome back. The 8th Annual Lawrence School Editorod is an event that helps students develop teamwork and problem-solving skills that can be applied at school, at home, and in the community. It's also a lot of fun. 
Every year uh, in the winter for our middle trimester in the engineering class, we do a project that's been based around the Iditarod sled dog race up in Alaska. It's an interdisciplinary project that we do where in their English class they'll research the race and individual mushers, compose letters to the mushers, usually hear back from them by the end of the race. We also have a GPS tracker uh, where we'll, students will be able to follow their musher in real time while we form our own teams in here of a student that volunteers to ride the sled and five to six students that volunteer to pull the sled. We've been doing this for, this will be our eighth year running. Um, we invite the rest of the school to come and watch. We also invite students from Morse Pond uh, that work on a, an Iditarod-based curriculum, as well as Mullen Hall uh, to come and wa watch us during the day and cheer on teams. This has grown over the years. We've been able to do some video work to connect different classrooms in the other schools with individual teams. We have a trophy and I get the winning team's name who does it in the fastest time engraved every year. And then we have previous winners come back from the high school uh, to pass the trophy along. Uh, which is a nice tradition to have. So the race has grown every year. It's reached the point where the race, we've worked out so many kinks along the way, we decided this year to add in a component, a little bit more of a larger cultural component to take a look at a little bit of controversy that's come up uh, in terms of current events in the Iditarod itself. Ever since the movie Sled Dogs was released, was a film documentary about conditions of kennels up in Alaska and British Columbia, uh, in which the dogs are um, seemingly either abused or maltreated. Uh, we decided to bring that as a social component into our project. What we're doing this year is in place of a more traditional open response question that where the students compare two articles, um, and write an essay about that, I've had them use an academic controversy to look at both sides of the argument. Uh, they read an article which is basically says um, the Iditarod looks the other way, along with other sled dog races, as an industry looks the other way while many kennels um, have poor living conditions for their animals. Um, another article is in favor of the veterinary care that the races such as the Iditarod provide. Um, and I asked the students to read both articles. They summarize key points and share with a member of the opposing team uh, and basically have a discussion about how do they feel. They come to their own consensus about this. The yeah, Iditarod holds dogs to reasonable standards of care because their health is monitored and maintained. And mushers are like required to carry a vet log, so they have to keep track of all their dogs and keep track of their health. They're not, they don't really do that. They keep them the good care though. Like they have a rule book for 40 years they've enforced this. They have 55 veterans that volunteer each race to t check up on dogs. Personally, in the beginning, I didn't know enough to have a strong opinion. But after reading the two articles, I feel that I'm more in the support of the animal rights groups so that the sled dogs should have better care conditions and not to have to be living outside on short chains. The Krusty Krabs team was this year's winner. Thanks to Ryan Weber for that story. FCTV wants you to know that television can be as easy as hitting record on your smartphone. We'd like to invite all Falmouth residents and visitors to share their slice of life with us. Email us your photos and videos or upload them to Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag MyFalmouth or Falmouth and Focus to be featured on the show. Thank you to our most recent contributors. We will be on hiatus during the move to the new Falmouth Community Media Center and will return on May 17th. We leave you now with the sights and sounds from the Falmouth School Science Fair featuring students from Mullen Hall School. Thank you for watching Falmouth and Focus. We'll see you in May. A snowflake starts with a water droplet in the cloud. It freezes into a ice crystal because it is really cold with six arms shaped like a beehive. And that's a hexagon. Water vapor freezes onto the ice crystal and causes it to grow. The corners grow faster because they stick out. This gives the star shape of the snow crystal with six arms. Snow crystals 
crash into each other and they get stuck together. That forms snowflakes. Snow crystals can have twins. That means it has 12 arms. Scientists say no two snow crystals are the same because they follow different paths in the cloud. Snow generated in labs. This scientist, he grew these snowflakes to look like a snow flower. Snow column and that it's shaped like a pencil. A capped column is the same thing. It just has these caps and the caps are just these ice crystals and that's snow in my backyard. <laughs>